It's an Englishman in the Balkans podcast. It's a very gloomy day here in my part of Bosnia and Herzegovina. We have rain uh, outside the window. If you can see behind, uh, it's not looking too summery. I'm joined today by somebody that I met in the very recent past. It's Dita Barami Verbanyac. I hope I pronounced that correctly. She lives in Travnik. Yes. And she gave me the most fantastic tour of her hometown. But we're not talking about Travnik as a town today. We're talking about folklore. And for those that don't know, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, as far as I'm aware as a foreigner, folklore plays a very important role in the culture of the country. Each of the major ethnic groups has their own way of portraying and describing their folklore. I'm going to be talking to Dita today to find out more. Why? Because she knows a lot about it. And I hope that you'll get something really cool to take away from today's podcast. And also, when you come to visit Bosnia and Herzegovina, you'll try and find out where some of this is actually happening so that you can see it and you can experience it. Now, I normally have this straight question, which I think works, and people have said, yes, it really does. My first question today is, who is Dita Bairami Verbanyac? How could I describe myself or give an answer to that question? So it's very hard when you need to talk about yourself, but I'll try. When it comes to folklore, Dita is someone who uh, probably doesn't know how to live without it because I've been a part of it for almost 34 years now here in Trami, shortly in Sarajevo while studying but mostly in Travnik. So my story goes back to the 1989 when my mom took me to a rehearsal to see some other girls and boys dancing, traditional dances. And that was it. It was a love at first sight. Since then, uh, I've been a part of my troupe uh, with different roles. And today, this last one, the last role I have, as you call it, directing. Maybe that's the one that I like the least, unfortunately, because I like dancing and performing on stages more than directing the troupe. So my life is related to folklore um, in a way that I don't know how to live without it. So when it comes to folklore, it's uh, my true and genuine love, and something that I, I truly enjoy doing. I, I live folklore. I can't say I do it. What aspects of Bosnian folklore and the culture inspire and motivate you, because you are passionate about it, to both preserve and promote the culture and the folklore itself through your dance troupe? In other words, what makes you want to get up every morning, think about it, do it? You said just now that it's part of your life. Without it, there is nothing. What really inspires you? I have to say that a very important word, love, is something that motivates me, whatever I do. So it's a part of folklore also. Love in the first place is something that motivates me. Uh, when it comes to the aspects of our culture and folklore, I may say that the aspect of identity is something that especially motivates me. Identity shown in music, traditional music, when it comes to folklore. 
then everything else that goes with it, costumes, stories told by the performance, lyrics that we have in these traditional songs. But in some broad sense, Boston culture has never been an individualist culture, if I may say so. It has always been a culture where some other things were significant, like bonding, gathering, socializing, where some necessary values emphasized both through formal and informal education and some other things that are related to identity are important. I, I must say that uh, we don't, uh, we, we can't uh, learn anything about folklore during our full formal education. So only if you get to be a part of an association or a troop or a group of people that values the tradition, that's the place where you can learn something about folklore. Well, folklore as a word can be related to tradition or heritage. It somehow goes together. You can't talk about uh, folklore without mentioning tradition, culture, heritage, and the other way around. When I've been out and about uh, in the country, and I am always fascinated when I come across uh, a folklore festival or I'm walking through a, a town or city streets and there's a troupe uh, dancing uh, with the accompanying music, I always look at the people that are observing. And I normally... I don't know, I assume that the local people are there in that location. And it seems that everybody is invested in it. In other words, there's a crowd of shoppers, they suddenly stop, they want to watch it, and they find it a very pleasant, a very exciting experience, I have to say, because you can see on their faces. But in the country, as you just said, it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody is invested in folklore. In other words, not every child will do it. Is, is that a correct thing to say, that not every child will do it? It's just those that feel passionate uh, about wanting to do this activity, these dances and these songs. Yes, <laughs> I must agree with you because I've already told you, my mom took me to rehearsal 34 years ago. Maybe if she hadn't done it at that point, I wouldn't have been here today. So not every child will know everything about folklore or be a part of it or get to know our tradition in this way. But we need to work on it because it's a part of our identity. I often say that to know where you are going, you must know where you come from. And that's related to tradition. Although we have troubles with these modern technologies, modern lifestyles, generally, modern generation, because somehow they don't value tradition in the way that maybe my generation did, or even older generations. Somehow traditional values have weakened among young people. And 
through phone call, maybe we can, and we are trying to uh, strengthen it. Tradition. Children learn by observing older people, by observing their sisters, brothers, relatives, family members, teachers, trainers. If we show them what to value and how to do it, they can learn it. That's what tradition generally is. It is something that we pass on through generations. You can't learn about it at school. When we were together walking around for three hours in Travnik not so long ago, we went into the castle and you took me into a circular building within the castle which had a museum in it. And when we went in there, there were traditional costumes from the various ethnic groups that live around the Vlasic mountain. And you explained to me that where I thought that it was one type of person that lived on the mountain, there were three different groups of people who dressed differently and you told me danced differently. So my next question for you is, is the folklore in Bosnia and Herzegovina a singular tradition? Are there just three traditions for the three major ethnic groups in the country? When it comes to folklore, we are in the area that's called Dinaric area, and rural tradition is somehow one one kind of tradition with different ethnic groups, maybe. Uh, some ethnic groups share some traditional elements, although they have their own identity. So I can't say that they are different traditions. I would say that we have one tradition, or at least one well, root, traditional root, and that we all come from it. And our costumes, although they are different, as you could see here in Tromney, they still have some similarities. So I wouldn't say that we're made of different traditions, but we have maybe one tradition. It's very hard work to use a tradition. So we have different elements of our Bosnian tradition. And Bosnian tradition means diversity. We, we are all united in diversity. So that's the beauty of it. We all speak the same language. When you are directing your troop, if I can use that word, is it? an easy task to create the choreography for a dance troupe. As I say, from an outsider, I am always fascinated about how everything goes together seamlessly, how everything has been, to me, really rehearsed so that the performances, the showing off of this tradition through dance and song is very powerful. It must be a difficult task for you to do that. Or do you have a library of a repertoire that you can always go back to? Well, now when uh, you're mentioning it, we have 18 choreographies on a stage. <laughs> A quite big number. 
uh, and all uh, these choreographies uh, were put on stage a long time ago. They are authentic and they are original as they were put sometimes during the 70s when we started with this troupe. So we, as a new generation of people dealing with it, uh, we are only practicing the same choreographies over the years. We try to put some new on the stage, some new choreographies, but today it's very difficult because they cost a, a, a lot of money. We need to have uh, a pretty much amount of money to, to put a new choreography, to pay someone to do it for you. I'm not a choreographer still. I just practice with the members and I also have other members who do it. They train them. So we're doing something that some generations did previously also. And they are always the same. Practice makes perfect. Today it may be a technology does a damage to new generations because they are very, how to say, lazy maybe. They spend a lot of time on their phones, social media. They don't move a lot. And we have pretty much troubles with small children coming to start performing and dancing when they want to become a member of our troupe, then it's very hard to, <laughs> especially when they are very small, to make them memorize which leg is left and which one is right. How damaging is it really? You're alluding that social media and the rise of digital technology could have a serious negative impact on folklore. And if there's no folklore, that means that's the start of the decline of the culture. So if we put those together, it is entirely possible, one train of thought, to say that unless something is found to, to counter this with young people, that the culture could disappear in 50 years, as you know it. Uh, when we talk about technology and folklore, it depends on how you use it in the way to you use it well, or you abuse it. <laughs> I don't know how to put it to relate it to folklore. From the point of view of social media and profiles that our members and all of us have on social media, uh, we can and we use it very often. Promotion. Then some people, as you have said, you walk around the street or you go and see a performance, then you probably take a photo of it, you uh, film a video and you post it on your profile. That's, that's something very good to promote. Folklore, maybe unconsciously people do it. So in the way, it can be very helpful for us from this side, being a part of some true or association. From some other point of view, when you have young people spending a lot of time on their social media, it's very hard to activate them to come and dance, to leave their phone somewhere, uh, to leave their social media profile somewhere, and to focus on dancing. So that's something that we are struggling with. But it can be used for promotion, for marketing. If you use it well, then 
technology can help you and social media also, but there is a bad side of it. Like in every other aspect. When we were in that museum and looking at those costumes and you were describing to me about the differences, I'm always fascinated about the intricacies of the costumes that the dancers wear, both male and female. And I've now got to the stage where I even say, we were in this part of Bosnia and they weren't wearing that. Why is that? Tamara is not in a position of knowledge to tell me the differences. But the costumes that your dance troupe wears and other dance troupe people wear, they are something that you cannot buy off the hook in a department store, in a shop. So how difficult is it in this day and age to find people with the skills to create these costumes that are so absolutely intricate and fascinating? I must say that maybe uh, in Tronic, we are still happy to have a couple of uh, older ladies doing it very well. They can take one of our costume and make uh, the same one. So they are very skillful. The, the problem will be when they unfortunately pass away and if young people don't learn how to do it, then in a couple of years, nobody will be able to get another costume because that is also something that goes from generation to generation. You've seen the lady in the old town, she's weaving and she's told you that uh, her grandmother taught her how to do it. So it's not something that you learn at school also. Something that you may learn at home from an older member of your family or from your neighbor or maybe a lady like this one in the old town. Maybe we should do something on that also in Bosnia or in the Balkans generally, because other countries like uh, Croatia, Serbia, Macedonia, they all have the same problem with folklore and troops and costumes. So we're happy to have a couple of old ladies that can do it for now, but I can't say that in the future the situation will be I, I'm not an optimist. These costumes are very expensive. So you can't buy them in stores, as you have already said. When you order them, it's something that's handmade and it costs a lot of money. So, for example, if we in our association or troop, if we don't have money, we can't buy it. We need support financial support. In Banja Luka, and this is slightly off topic in a way, but very re relative, there is a boat called the Dayak that is punted up and down the river Verbas. I know. And the Dayak has or did have only two families that handmade, handcrafted those boats. It is now down to one family. And when I spoke to a member of that family, I said, what happens if your son doesn't pick, or your daughter even, doesn't pick up this very traditional skill to make these boats? What will happen? And he said, it's all over. I put the question to him. I won't quote his name, but I said, but surely the city must do something about this because it's the city's culture and the city or the management of the city is responsible for the maintenance of the culture. Do you think that if 
people could stimulate their city or town management, that might happen because they are the keepers of the city's money. So can the city, can the town councils help financially? Should they help financially? Yes, of course. And I think that each city or town in Bosnia has a part of its budget that goes for culture and sports. That's how we get, in my troop, some money. They partly finance us. They find a way to give us some money. Uh, but the amount that they are giving and that they plan in their budget, they're not enough. The amount of money are not enough for everything that each member deserves, each troop deserves, and association. Because uh, maybe now I'm not being humble, but we are maybe the best ambassadors of our country or town or city when we go outside Bosnia and show some other people and other nations, other countries, what we have in Bosnia, what we preserve, what's our tradition. Maybe that's one of the most important reasons why every level of government, of local government, I don't know, we have Canton, they support us, I must say that. They support us financially, but sometimes that's not enough because we have a lot of things that we can offer, that we can show, and we probably represent Travnik and uh, some villages around Travnik that we perform a choreography from that village the best way we can. Nobody can do it better than we. How often do you actually travel? And Tamara said, you have to ask Dita this question because Tamara spent seven years in Canada uh, and there was in the province where she was living, and she was living in Winnipeg. I can't remember the Canadian province that Winnipeg is in, but they had folklorama. And she said it was amazing to see dance troops coming from Greece from a home country of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Traveling to Canada is a stretch, I would imagine. But how often do you manage to take your troop outside of the country to promote Bosnia, as you say, is so important? Before this war that happened in Bosnia, the Bosnian conflict during the 90s, our troop traveled more, I must say that. And my colleague, older colleagues, they traveled around Europe. They even visited England. They were very often traveling outside. At that point, it was Yugoslavia. But now, as I have said, we need money for everything. Today, when you want to go somewhere, you need money for the accommodation, for the bus, some things that we cannot pay sometimes. And that's when that support comes to the surface. That's the point where we see who supports us. A, a month ago, in June, the youngest ensemble went to Serbia, to Zlatibor, and they had a great time. They were there for two nights, three days, and they had great time. Something that they will probably remember till the rest of their lives. And when it comes to folklore, it's not just dancing. Or if the people in Bosnia to say, it's very hard to translate it in English, but they say, 
oh, you just dance the color. You don't do anything else. But that's not it. Because if you are a part of a troupe, folklore, troupe, traditional dancers, uh, then you become very skillful in some things. We educate members to be adroit, to learn how not to be afraid to have a public appearance, to, to perform publicly, to then they meet other members of other troops. They have some new friendships. They uh, develop different skills, as I had said. So it's very important to, uh, if I may say, to invest in, in folk or troops because we are trying to make good people in the first place. And for all of that, you need money. If you don't have it, you, if you don't have money, you can't travel. And traveling is something that's always related to folklore and traditional dances. People always related folklore or traditional dances, associations with traveling. And that was something that motivated them to become members of traditional dance troops. It's so that we travel often outside Bosnia, but we at least try to, for example, next weekend on Sunday, this weekend, on Sunday, uh, we are performing mm -hmm. in Foinica. Next weekend, we are in Sarajevo, small children, small members. Uh, we have different groups of different ages. So at least we try to travel around Bosnia. It's cheaper. You mentioned about the dance troupe going to, to Slatibor. And you said yeah. that some of the experiences that they will have had will stay with them for the rest of their lives. What is, this is a very fast question, so please bear with me. What is Dita's <laughs> most powerful memory of her time as a younger member of the dance troupe? So I remember traveling to Turkey. It was not long ago. It was 2008, maybe nine. I'm not really sure. And I will never forget that uh, we had to spend, I think, six hours in Bulgaria because policemen took our drivers to check something and... <laughs> Everything else was great, but that's the memory that stays forever in my mind. But we, uh, even in that situation, we had some great time. We were singing because we didn't have any problems. We were just waiting. So we were doing something we know how to do best that was singing and dancing in the street while waiting. So passers-by were looking at us, like, who are these people dancing in the street? They took some photos of us. We were probably very interesting to those who were passing by. When we finally got to Turkey, then we were like nine days in Turkey, not in Istanbul, from the other side, in a smaller town called Yalova. Our accommodation was in a camp with different troops from all over the world, and it was great. We've been talking for about 40 minutes, and I know that your time is precious, but my final question for you while we're talking about all of the 
relative parts of folklore from the way that it's part of the culture to the possible really not so bright future. I'd like to ask you what advice you would give to young individuals, young people, for example, that stumble across this podcast, most probably from the country or the, the neighboring countries. What advice would you give to young individuals today who wish to pursue or be actively involved in preserving and promoting folklore and the culture, the cultural heritage of where they come from? I've been working with young people for many years now. And the one thing that I have learned is that they hate being advised <laughs> by anybody on any topic. Uh, I, I would recommend them to be actively involved in a troop if they uh, want to promote tradition. Because uh, I would always recommend activities that include more people, not individual activities. You like, uh, you have individual and team sports. The more, the merrier. If you're in team sport, then it probably gets more interesting. When you have a team of people, then it's probably more interesting. So I would always recommend activities that include more people. In this case, if we're talking about, when we're talking about folklore, then activities uh, are also music, great time. They include traveling. It's a special feeling when you can represent your country. You must feel it to know what it is. So you can learn different skills as a part of a dancing troupe. Uh, then we very often have activities that include a studio of modern dances in Kronik. For young people living in Kronik, it's very good to be a part of this folklore too. And probably uh, all around Bosnia, different towns and cities, uh, these folklore troops or traditional dance troops, they have some activities and probably are being a part of projects where they can learn a lot of things. It's not just come and dance. It's more than that. It's always more than that. So the meaning of the word folk and lore, they tell you enough that it's more than dancing. And also, uh, I must add something before we, we finish. I want to go back to the point where we discussed support of local governments, councils, and different people, businessmen, important people, parents, everybody who can give us support. If we, or those, or everybody who genuinely love traditional dances decide one day that they don't want to sacrifice their time for it, everything could be lost. Because to be a part of a traditional dance troupe, regardless of the role that you're playing in it, everything could be lost if you don't love it. So the, the future of, of folklore uh, somehow lies in all of us. We are all responsible for preserving it. Of course, those who love it, uh, they will try hard to preserve everything that they have. And 
when I got this role a year ago, as you say, directing the troop, managing it, that happened because older people uh, had to retire. So somebody had to continue doing it. If I didn't accept the rule, I can't say what uh, could happen. <laughs>